smoked him one with nature and if you're a believer one with god definitely gets your heart pumping boy you are in trouble all obsession podcast what's up folks my name is sam thrash i'm your fall obsession podcast host for this week's episode our podcast is driven by our friends over at ridge rock hunt company and i will talk more about them uh, later on at the end of our episode today Uh, i am on here with our guest this week our fall obsession production director nick powell welcome back nick hey it's always good to be back sam Always good to jump back on, jump back on a podcast with you, man. I feel like I gotta calm down my intro almost because last <laughs> week Drew hosted his first podcast episode from the Midwest version of our of our podcast, and Heck yeah. he, he was so he was so like calm and professional and and soothing <laughs> in his intro and everything. I was like, man, that sounds so so good, so clean. Now I'm like, yeah. I gotta I gotta dial it down a little bit. <laughs> and I feel like that's just how Drew is. He's yeah. just cool, calm, and collected all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a good thing we got going now. So for, if you're a new listener, uh, I've hosted a majority of our podcasts over the past couple of years that we've been doing this. And now we're kind of splitting it up a little bit in different areas of the country. Drew's our marketing director, and he's going to be hosting some podcasts in the Midwestern region with some guests relevant to there. We're still going to be doing the podcast, you know, Nick and I down here with, uh, with Southern guests and, and other guests across the country. But Kind of, kind of splitting up the workload a little bit and uh, adding some more diversity to our to our podcast network and everything. So um, every week you're going to have either myself or Drew on here, which is going to be pretty cool. So I'm um, looking forward. He was texting me the other day about some guests he's getting lined up up there. So it's we're going to have Sweet. some good content coming from the Midwest. I'm excited. So that's awesome. But in the meantime, so we're back on here. We're back in Texas this week. Heck yeah, we our, are. Yeah, heck yeah, on our podcast. <laughs> and uh, to talk about, honestly, a, a really cool story, how it all transpired, relevant to you, Nick, because yep. you got to do, you got to check off a bucket list item, man. For sure. And every week we ask we ask our guests, especially the first timers on the podcast, you know, what are, what are bucket list hunts that you want to do that you haven't gotten to do yet? And we fi- we you got to do one. You know, I got one, got one knocked out. Yeah, yeah. so I was very fortunate. We're gonna dive in and we're gonna talk about that and and learn about this this incredible experience down here in Texas that you got to head. So I'm I'm turning it over to you. Let Let's dive in and figure out how this opportunity came about. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I'll start by saying that I'm pretty sure I've said on this podcast before that an axis deer hunt is number two on my bucket list. So with a, an elk hunt being the first access is number two and uh so this last weekend i was very fortunate enough to get an opportunity to harvest an axis uh for myself a nice axis buck um and it came about uh with a group local to the town that we work in uh me and sam are both firefighter paramedics in in a town here in dfw and uh this group is called the therapeutic recreation group shout out to pj and robbie over there um but they uh basically the way it works is they take uh military vets first responders law enforcement officers um who are uh currently active or i'm going to take that out they're not active they might not be active because of veterans but anyways um they take those guys out and just get basically give them an opportunity to get outdoors and unwind uh from the everyday stresses of of the, the job that we do so um, and every outing that they take, they're fairly new, uh, like maybe a couple years old. And so every outing that they do at the end of it, they get, uh, a nomination from everybody there. And so I was fortunate enough to be nominated, um, by a buddy of mine who we work with, who went last, uh, to the last outing. And then, um, this time we went out to, um, a high fence ranch in Breckenridge, Texas called the M5 ranch. Shout out to, um, Dr. Mack out there and everybody, everybody out there who helped us out and, and made that possible. But it was basically, um, 
an all expenses paid trip to the M5 ranch to harvest an axis deer. And so uh, we head out and they, they told us it was going to be from this day to this day. And so PJ reached out from reached out to me and said, Hey, are you available from this day to this day? And I basically told him that if I wasn't, I was going to be, uh, yeah. I was going to make this happen because like, like we said before, this was a huge, uh, bucket list hunt for me. So, yeah, I mean, you, you don't pass that up. You, you yeah, just exactly. And so, um, I made, I was, and everything lined out perfectly, uh, for work. I didn't have anything going on that weekend with, you know, family or friends or anything like that. Nothing planned. I did have to work, but I was able to get that day off, uh, somehow, you know, cause, uh, Sam knows that it's, it's very difficult, uh, to get a day off where you don't have to pay it back at some point. But yeah. <clears throat> anyways, uh, so we head out, uh, Friday, they do all the introductions and we show up and, um, these guys have, uh, so many gifts and, and things for us. Cause it was uh, me and five other guys or four other guys, sorry, five total. And they have all kinds of gifts lined out for us. Um, shout out to, uh, Rob Heffley at Arkansas Sportsman and up in Arkansas, he donated five rifles and we were gifted a rifle each. Um, and with a gun case, a uh, backpack, a range bag, um, and all on top of a free access hunt. And so it was really an incredible experience uh, to be able to go out there um, and be able to harvest an access. And the, uh, it really gave me a, a different perspective on high fence hunting because I've never done it before. And so having limited experience doing that, it gave me an insight on what it's actually like to go and, and do that. So, yeah, that that's, and I really hope that people continue listening and didn't turn off the podcast when they heard high fence ranch, because yes, because there's, there's this, this misconception, this predetermined, notion in everybody's mind i feel like that that high fence is just shooting fish in a barrel you know and i'm not saying there's not places out there where that's the experience you had but as we're about to found find out you had to hunt like you I did. You, you had to hunt so absolutely i want to i want to debunk early on in the podcast the the misconception of texas high fence ranches because it a, a properly and and very well managed high fence ranch is is not necessarily shooting fish in a barrel that high fence around the outside especially of a piece of property that's big enough is is more to ensure that what you're trying to do in regards to managing your own population uh managing your own herd managing your own genetics you know and what you're feeding the animals you have making sure that that stays within your own your own means you're not just trying Absolutely. to over you're not just trying to overpopulate the property in effort to make it as easy as possible you're you're trying to control control the the animals and the environment that you have when it comes to you know how those animals are maturing and absolutely high fence ranches they keep animals from leaving but just as much as they do that they keep animals that you don't want in your property genetics that you don't want in your property from coming in so mm -hmm. it works both ways so i wanted to address that pretty early on before you know people start thinking that you know you're you're just going out there for a for an, an easy weekend you know yeah and it, because it was everything but and i'm glad you touched on that sam because um i had the the same notion that probably some of our listeners do like i had the same feeling of like man uh this is going to be really cool and it's probably going to be easier than the everyday you know low fence hunt um but boy was i humbled for sure <laughs> um and i got to give it to m5 they do it they do it the right way because there's a way that you can uh th there's a process you know and and growing these deer and these exotics um to not only be what you want but also be um not to where they're just coming up eating out of your hand right. you know there's a there's a process in doing that and m5 does it correctly um and so in an effort to to not give too much information away because I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to downgrade their process and tell everybody if they're, if it's a secret or anything, I'm not sure. But, um, yeah. 
I don't because I don't think it is, but just in case, you know, I want to be safe and respect the 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 uh, process that they have over there. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, but they they have an awesome process that that gives these deer. Uh, they really do care for the animals, um, and they they really take care of them in a top notch way. Uh, but they also not only do they care for them in a top notch way, but they also uh, release them in a way that like I said, they're not going to come eat out of your hand. They're still going to be wild and weary and you have to, and it really changes the way you hunt. Like you have to, you can't just go sit in a blind and pick which out one you pick, which one you want, and then take an easy shot. Like you have to pay attention to your wind, pay attention to your scent. You really have to uh, get there at the right time. And um, even if there is a bunch of deer that come to the feeder, like we had, so I guess I'll just dive into my experience because yeah. uh, it was really neat. So the first night we did, we basically just got to the ranch, got to know everybody and hung out that night. It was Friday night. So Saturday was going to be our hunt day. And then Sunday we were going to eat breakfast and head out that morning. Uh, so, and I don't know if any of our listeners have ever hunted access. I'm sure there are some out there who have, but they are super skittish animals. Like, whitetail times two you know like it's it's not they're not an easy animal to hunt and there were several people who worked there and were around them all the time said that they were one of the hardest animals out there that they have that they're the hardest animals to hunt so um and so getting five axis in a 24 to 36 hour period is not an easy tax uh, not an easy task yeah um so day two uh, Saturday, Saturday morning, we all went and sat out in different blinds with our guides. And, uh, the, there was only two or three of us who actually saw any axis that morning. And so, uh, the, the blind that I sat in, we saw some, they have some, uh, black Hawaiian sheep out there. They have a bunch of different kinds of sheep, um, axis deer, all dad. Um, they just got some elk recently. If anybody's interested in an elk hunt, um, what else do they have white tail obviously and then i feel like i'm missing something they have wildebeest black buck and orcs too right black buck and orcs that's what that's what i was missing um so saturday morning uh we all sit in our blinds and there's only a few of us who saw animal saw any axis uh the blind that i sat in we had some black hawaiian sheep come in we had several white tail come in one big like 170 180 inch white tail who was probably a one or two year old which is just just crazy to think about um i mean they have they have two year olds who are 200 plus inches easy and so uh ridiculous we we, yeah we didn't see anything that morning um and so the throughout the day we just basically drive around and uh i can throw a picture we can throw a picture up if we're if we're planning on putting this on youtube we throw a picture up of the humvee that that m5 has we rode around in that quite a bit um, yeah. They have a Humvee with a big hunting rack on top. It's freaking the baddest vehicle I've ever hunted out of. But um, we basically drove around in that during the day. So that morning we drove around, and uh, around lunchtime they realized, hey, these these axes are going to be more difficult than we had in- anticipated. And that's the owners of the ranch saying that. Wow. So um, around lunchtime we had gotten uh, the go-ahead to kill – if we couldn't get an axis, we got to go ahead to kill an Audad, an Oryx, um, a sheep, uh, like the Black Hawaiian, um, Corsican, Mouflon sheep um, that they had out there, and and then the axis. Those were our those were our options. Um, and this might have been a little bit after lunchtime, and so uh, we, the group that I was with. Uh, we had come across this, they call it the Savannah and it's just an area of their ranch. That's like an African Savannah basically. And we had seen, we saw some Oryx going by there and it was like a last minute, um, decision of, Hey, we got to go ahead for y'all to kill one of these. Does one of you, do you, do one of you want one of these mm-hmm. instead of the axis? And they were probably 200 yards in front of us and they were going to cross right in front of us. It was all set up pretty perfectly, not set up. It, it all happened pretty perfectly. <laughs> um, um, and so these orcs come out and uh, PJ, the guy who runs uh, therapeutic recreation group was like, man, I've killed one of these before. They are 
really good eating there it's a lot of meat and like at this point i realized that the axis were going to be really difficult to hunt and i had an opportunity right in front of me and so i i was like yeah let's do it i'll, I'll take one of these and so they hopped out gave me the shooting sticks i got set up on the shooting sticks and there was one uh, big bull in in this herd of oryx and he was when i say big like a horse running across the across the field i mean just massive and uh for those of y'all who are don't know what an oryx looks like just google scimitar horned oryx and that's what they have running around basically for the listeners who don't know but uh this bull had like massive horns that came all the way back uh like almost scratched his his hind end i mean just a huge animal and so me being the the blue collar like hunt white tail my whole life never had an opportunity to shoot anything else basically i was amped like <laughs> buck fever times 10 and so I, I hop out of the humvee go get the shooting sticks get set up on this dude and i mean they're they're going perfectly broadside my uh, rifle zeroed at 100 and so uh and this is a rifle that I've never shot before. So I'm not blaming it on the rifle. The rifle was on point. It was definitely me, uh, not being experienced with that, with that, uh, weapon. So, um, all in all to say, I got set up, got on this dude and, uh, being unfamiliar with it, I jerked the trigger a little bit and I missed, it was a clean miss. They like, they weren't running. It was not, it was not anything that the, the gun did. It was all on me. Um, but I had, missed this animal super easy like he was staring at me i pulled the trigger shot and he just kept staring at me and then just trotted off real slow <laughs> so it wasn't like he wasn't uh he, he wasn't injured at all there was no no uh no sign of any injury whatsoever and we went and checked for blood just in case you know a big animal uh and there was nothing no sign of anything so mm. after that we drive around see if we could find him again, see if we can find any access. We drive around, drive around, whatever. Uh, and um, there's only one guy at this point who had killed anything. Uh, and this was like three or four o'clock in the afternoon. And so on the on our hunt day, like we're all supposed to kill access on this one day. Yeah. And there's only one person that's that's killed one. That's how difficult these animals are. And so... Uh, so how, are you, how are you feeling at this point? It's, it's like the pressure's on, like big time. And I'm really hoping for some luck in the uh, in the evening hunt. And so we we go and we go back to the to the lodge, which is phenomenal, by the way. Like they have a, a single lodge with um, I don't know, it'll probably sleep twenty people, and then they have individual cabins right next to the lodge. And so it's like uh, they have, I think they have three or four individual cabins, which are awesome as well. Like this place, if you guys are looking for uh, a hunt that and you you want you don't mind hunting high fence, it doesn't have to be uh, low fence or whatever. Go check out M Five Ranch because they will take care of you. Like the food was top notch, the service was top notch, and I think they like I could have gone in a, a set of clothes and they would have even had spare clothes for me to put on like hunting clothes to put on and uh had extra toothbrush whatever we needed like it was incredible customer service um top tier folks over there uh so go check them out um but it's getting like three or four o'clock in the afternoon one person's killed uh one guy shot one but he couldn't find it right when he squeezed the trigger it moved and knocked it down got back up ran off uh so they knew it was injured uh, cause we had found it later, later on and we had seen it and it was, we confirmed that it was hit. Um, but they had found that later that night, later that evening. And so that makes two guys that had killed. And then one guy killed a fallow. He was able to uh, harvest a fallow. Um, and so three out of the five of us had killed something. And, uh, so that night came, the evening hunt came and, we go sit in our blinds, whatever, neither of us see anything. Mm -hmm. And I'm bow hunting the whole time when we hunt out of blinds. And so we're like right there next to the feeder. Um, and so I think that might have been what uh, hindered me in the long run. 
because I think the wind, something with the wind wasn't right or, or, uh, but they were super aware that we were there and just never came in really. We never saw hardly anything. The whitetail are abundant out there. And so they came up in droves, <laughs> you know, there were several whitetail under the feeder. Um, but just nothing, nothing that I was able to, to harvest, nothing I've been given the green light on. Yeah. So we go back empty handed that night and I'm thinking like, cause there, there had been some, some talk of like, well, maybe they can hunt Sunday morning. Um, but the guys that we were there with, uh, were like, no, we're, if y'all can get something tonight, that's it kind of deal. And so we were like, okay. Uh, which I wasn't going to complain because it, it, regardless of whether I had harvested something or not, it had been a phenomenal trip. And those people, like, they take such good care of you that it, that was worth it in itself. So yeah. um, that night comes, we all go back and we're checking out, you know, everybody's animals that they had killed that day. And, you know, just checking, just looking at them up close was, was something that, like, I never expected. I never expected them to be so big. Yeah. Um, cause I would, I would compare them. I think we're just used to whitetail, the Southern whitetail who are kind of smaller in stature. Um, even the bucks, I mean, there's some big bucks here in North Texas, but, uh, they're just not, not that big. You know, I, I would compare them closer to like some, a Northern whitetail, maybe up like Ohio, Iowa area. Yeah. Um, I was just bigger bodied really. I was going to say like you get up into the, into the Northern region up in the canada places like that the yeah. whitetail are considerably bigger in in body size and and i would I, yeah i agree with that and access is like a a whitetail on steroids when it comes to body yeah. size you know exactly so. exactly and um from what i hear they're phenomenal eating so mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to that and obviously everybody knows uh the end of the story but we'll get there um so anyways, we get through this, we get through, uh, get ready for dinner and you know, the sun didn't set till like eight 30. And so we're, it's like nine, 10 o'clock at night and we're eating dinner, uh, which was awesome by the way. Uh, and the, the guys who are out there with us, our hosts are like, Hey, uh, do you guys want to hunt in the morning? If they opportunity, like if they offer that and I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I do. You know? And so this is a once in a lifetime, you know, I might not get this opportunity again. And yeah. so, uh, they're like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, or I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And so they, uh, have a conversation and apparently the, the owners of the ranch are like, yeah, we figured y'all were going to do that anyway. <laughs> like we were expect we were expecting y'all to hunt tomorrow morning. So yeah. it all worked out. They were gracious enough to let us stay and hunt that next morning. And so, uh, going into Sunday morning, I had my mind set up or I had my mind set on an Oryx, a scimitar horned Oryx. Like I, that's what I, that was what I was going to kill. Um, and so right now, as, as it stood Saturday night, two axis and one fallow had been down. Uh, the guy that I was hunting with, uh, Sunday morning also wanted an axis. So I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll take an Oryx. The oryx are more of a, hor uh, a herd animal, so they don't necessarily come into the feeder. They go out into the into the fields and graze uh, as a herd. So uh, sitting at the feeder, I wasn't expecting an oryx to come up, but we were in that area. Uh, so that Sunday morning, uh, we were sitting at in, in the bow blind, and we had uh, on our way walking to the to the blind, we had um, a pig. We had spooked a pig, just a little probably 75 pound pig not nothing too crazy and he wasn't in any hurry to leave i don't think because he just kind of trotted off and we got in there and the feeder went off and it wasn't 20 seconds later that pig was trotting up to this feeder hmm. and so we have a pig uh at the feeder and they were like pigs are free game i feel like pigs are always kind of free game because yeah. they're you know they can get out of control pretty easy so i get uh I make the decision that I'm going to, I'm going to shoot this pig. Well, my arrow stash or cash is not very, uh, abundant. So I had two arrows total and, uh, I had, which I have more than that, but I only have two broadheads. So, uh, oh, we can I, have, fix that. <laughs> I know. And I need to, and that was my plan. I planned on doing that this year and I still need to, to get on that before 
September, uh, October gets here. But anyways, that's, so. that's another conversation. Yeah, another, another talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, so I had, I had my arrow that I wanted to kill big game with, and then I had an arrow that I didn't really care about. So I had to switch my arrows, and as I'm switching my arrows, three more pigs about the same size come up. And so there's four pigs standing around the feeder. Because the guide's like, hey, you can shoot that pig or you can wait and see if something else comes in. So I wanted to shoot something, so I decided to shoot that pig. So I'm switching my arrow out. Those three pigs come up, and uh, I get ready to draw back, and then another one comes up. I'm like, oh, I need to range them. So I go and range them, range the one I want. And as I as I put my uh, range finder down, the last one that came up, you could tell he was kind of the group, the, the ringleader. Mm-hmm. He gave one big, you know, snort, and all five of them jokers took off. Really? Yeah. And so I don't know if maybe they, maybe he was onto something that they weren't aware of, or maybe he saw me move. I'm not real sure, but all five of them jokers took off. Was your wind swirling at all? There wasn't. There wasn't any wind. No wind. So that's what. Hmm. That's kind of what we think was that it was just kind of stagnant down there. Yeah. Uh, and that that we our scent was just kind of hovering a little bit. Hmm. Um, but anyways. Uh, my my uh, guide Nate, he was like, "Hey, there's an axis buck coming right now." So his axis starts coming to the feeder, and I never even see him. And he's like, "Oh, he just because I, now I have to switch my arrows back, right? Because I have my hog arrow in. So now I have to switch my arrows back." He says, "There's an axis coming, so I'm trying to switch them. Be quiet, you know." And I, I I'm going to get my arrow in. He's like, "Oh, he took off." And then after that, that was all we saw that morning. And so uh, they told us, they were like, hey, if nothing comes in pretty quick after the feeder spins, we'll come pick you up and we'll drive around and find you something. Yeah. I'm like, fantastic. Let's do that. So they come pick us up. And um, it was really cool because um, it was really a team effort, I would, I would say. Uh, like the guy who, who, lost his, who shot his axis and lost it, there was so many people out there trying to help him find it. And they like walked through uh, – hundreds of yards of, of woods and, and mesquites and stuff to find this deer. And they, they ended up doing that. And so the three di- three guys that had, had killed Saturday um, while I was in the blind, they were out driving around looking for Oryx for when, like just in case nothing happened that morning at the feeder. And so when they came and picked us up, they were like, Hey, by the way, we found the Oryx. And so we're like, here we go. Now's our chance, you know? So we go and uh, we go find the, find the orcs and we get on um we find one it was a female she was all by herself and she might not have been but she was the only one we saw and so we find this female and we keep driving around and then we don't see anything and so we hear that the other guy there's another um and another guy that hadn't killed and so he had shot an axis that morning and so we were going to meet up with them and we meet up with them and they're like hey we saw uh we saw one lone bull we saw a group of oryx with a big bull and then we saw one lone bull up over here and so we're like perfect so me and my guide hop in uh with the owner of the ranch and we drive around and robbie robbie was with us too uh who's with trg and so we go and find we go to that one lone bull and we find him and they're like, hey, he's got one broke horn uh, on the left side. And I'm like, at this point, I don't care. I'll shoot him. And so they're like, okay, great. And so we find him, we get on him, and then he just starts walking away. As I, as I put my crosshairs on him, he starts walking away, like directly away from us, so I don't have a good shot. And then um, we're like, hey, if we, if we back out and go back around this road, we'll hit this tank that's on the, on the right side of the road. Y'all can go down in this tank because everything, all the water was really low out there because of the drought we're having this year. Mm-hmm. And so we get to this tank and they're like, once you get over that dam on the other side, that orc should be walking right towards you. You'll have an awesome shot. Right. And so we get to this tank, me and the guy jump out. Uh, and the guy at this time was Luke. He's the owner's son, Luke Mack. And, uh, we get out, we go up this, we go across this tank, go up this tank dam, uh, this tank dam, and we're walking really slow, really quiet, and we're just kind of peeking over the tank dam. And we're looking in the direction that this orc should be coming from, and we're scanning, we've got the binos out, and we're scanning, we're glassing, 
we don't see anything. And then all of a sudden back at the truck, uh, Andy, the owner of the ranch is like, Lou, he's right there. He's right there. And like 20 yards to our left. So we're looking to the right and 20 or 30 yards to our left. He's down the, down the tank dam and he's walking away from us. Oh man. <laughs> and so, uh, he had just passed where we were going to ambush him at. Basically he had just passed it. Oh man. And so we get on him and I get my crosshairs on him and they just start whistling like, Hey, you know, look over here. And so he kind of turns his head and he ain't worried about nothing really. And so he kind of turns and looks and he's, uh, quartered real hard away from us. And then as soon as I'm getting ready, cause like I have a kind of a shot and I'm like, this might be my only opportunity, but I didn't want to rush it again. Cause that happened the day before. Right. And so I get on him and I'm, I'm just waiting. And then he gets behind a tree and just keeps walking away. Just keeps walking. They're like, come back you know well he's gonna cross the road and we'll catch him up there so we we sprint back to the truck and hop in the truck and we drive real slow up to where he's at where he crossed the road and now like i don't know how this dude never went faster than a walk but he could cover some ground i i don't know how he did it so fast but that dude could cover some ground because he was already 100 yards on the other side of the road i mean he's moving but he's not, you know, he's walking, the, but he's moving. Yeah. It was the weirdest thing. Um, but I guess that's what like out in Africa, that's what they do. That's yeah. all they do is just walk. And so that that's what they're built for. Um, and so we find him again after he crosses the road and, and he's like, Hey, I think if you go around, we'll be able to cut him off. And Luke's like, I think we can just walk after him. And I'm like, I don't care what we do. Y'all just <laughs> tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's like, I think we can walk after him and catch him. And so we hop out of the truck and we start barreling off into the, into the woods and we're following him and we can see him and we never really lose sight of him. Uh, like we'll lose him and then we'll find him. We'll lose him and then we'll find him. We follow him probably two, 300 yards and then we lose him. Mm -hmm. We get to a road and we're like, we have, I have no idea where we, where he went. Um, and so then, he calls Andy and Andy brings the truck around, picks us up. And so then we're circling the entire quadrant that this, that this works where we think he is, uh, should be. So we, we come around and as we're, as we come around, uh, uh, Andy goes, Hey, there's some, uh, axis right there. And there's a buck that runs out and then like six or seven does that follow him. And they're at a full sprint, uh, like, if our truck is straight and we we're using the clock method, mm -hmm. so 12 o'clock is on six clocks in the back. Yeah. These axes are running from probably 10 or 11 o'clock and they're running towards 12 o'clock. So they're running from left to right. Right. And he's like, Oh, that's the, that's the broke one that we uh, saw, you know, yesterday. And we're like, Oh, okay. And Luke looks to the left and there's another one. He goes, there's another buck right there and he's not broke. And so he's just running. And then, uh, so I pop the door open and I put my rifle up on the mirror and they're whistling at him and everything to stop him. And there's an oak tree that's probably three foot wide. Dang. Uh, and he stops right before he gets behind that oak tree and he's probably five or six feet behind it. He stops right before he gets to that oak tree. And like, all I can see is, uh, probably about half of half neck and back. So I can see his entire body. And so I put that crosshair right behind his shoulder and this time. I squeezed the trigger how it's supposed to be squeezed, and he he did the old donkey kick and and took off. Nice. Took off into the thick trees, and so we were like, okay, he's hit for sure. And so uh, we wait there probably 10, 15 minutes, and we see the rest of them. Uh, there's a road off to probably our three o'clock, and we see the rest of them cross that road. The the one the broke buck, and then the the dose, and the the one that I shot never crossed that road. So we're like, okay, he's in those trees somewhere. And so we wait 10, 15 minutes and we go start looking for blood and we find just like a drop of blood here, drop of blood there, drop of blood there. And so we're like, Oh, great. You know, like this is going to, we're going to be, we're going to be a while. And so we find, we start, they start getting more consistent, more consistent. And then, uh, Luke grabs me and he said, Hey, look right up there. And my axe is laying there stone cold dead, <laughs> right about just about 50 yards from where we shot him. And, uh, I could not explain, I can't put into words the, the excitement I felt 
seeing that axis lay there. It was just like down to the wire. Uh, and usually like, I don't consider myself a very lucky guy, but, uh, so like when it comes down to the wire like that, especially after last season, I know everybody's heard the story from last yeah. season, yeah. especially after that, man, it, I have not had the best, uh, track record, but seeing that axis laid there, it's just like a one, a weight lifted off my shoulders and then, uh, for multiple reasons. And then two, it was like, I finally did it. Like I finally was able to something worked out, you know, cause it was just like the whole trip driving around i was sitting on the driver's side because i'm right-handed and uh it was just like every axis we saw was on the passenger side and like nothing ever came into the feeders uh that i sat at and so it was just like the opportunity was never there you know and so for this this dude to stop and he was the only one in the whole herd that stopped the rest of them never even looked twice you know and so he was the only one to stop he stopped long enough for me to get a shot off like everything worked out perfectly and uh i got to give it to those guys for robbie and and andy and luke for sticking with me till the literally the last second because like breakfast was ready uh and so we loaded them up got all of our our pictures loaded them up and went ate breakfast and uh it was just freaking awesome man freaking awesome that's incredible man Uh, a bucket list hunt for sure that you get to get to check off the check off the list that's that's an incredible experience for sure. One you yeah. Never forget. Yeah, and luckily I get I get to have them on the wall. Shout out to to Thomas and Jonathan Ivy with Crane Works in Kilgore, Texas. They uh, took care of taxidermy for all of the hunters, which is un undescribable, like unbelievable. Mind can't, I can't thank those guys enough. Um, and then everybody at M Five and and then TRG. So can't say thank you enough. And I feel like that's all I've said, but. Um, yeah, no, it, just can't it, can't thank those guys enough. It, it's genuine, man. Like like you you mentioned at the beginning, what TRG is trying to do, and and you know getting the getting these vets and first responders and everybody out, and you know you you don't you don't want to look at it from a perspective of oh I get to go on a free hunt, you know I, I feel right. like because because my my driver at work was another one of the one another one of the guys that got to go with you. Yes, and so I would I would I was actually last shift I was sitting at the kitchen table you know one of those late night firehouse talks and he was he was telling me all about it you know and and his experience and he's a guy who has never like he used to hunt you know back when he lived in lived out west and everything he'd hunt elk and stuff every year growing up but he's never really hunted in Texas since he's lived here and you know he was telling me about the experience he's like man I, I showed up and I felt cared for like from the very from the very second I stepped out of my vehicle and and you know that 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 speaks volumes your story speaks volumes you know that they that they truly care about the guys that they're taking out there and and they genuinely want it to be a as tr- a stress free you know experience now now you have stress in that you're trying to kill an animal you know down sure. the wire they can't really help that you know but but they're doing everything they can to take everything off off these folks plates and just have it be an enjoyable, relaxing, decompressed weekend, you know, for everybody. Yes, and, and it's, it felt like, and me and uh, your driver, we, we talked in, uh, as well as one other guy who went with us, one other firefighter who went with us, and we all, we all were like, man, it's just, it's just weird, because uh, in, in our profession, we're so used to taking care of other people, and uh, not always being taken care of ourselves, and so... It was just weird at first. Yeah. Uh, it's not in our to, blood. It's not, you know? Yeah. And so like we're, we're protectors, we're providers and that like, that's what we do. We are servant, we're servants basically. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, it was just so strange at first to get, to get out of that and be like, okay, well now somebody's repaying this favor. And something that I always say is like, and I've talked with, with several people about this, but it's like, we have, we we never have an issue when someone asks us for help like we we're always willing to help somebody but when we when it's time for us to ask for the help we don't and mm-hmm. so uh and uh, on top of that like i feel like uh being a christian i know it's kind of random but being a christian like that's what god put us here for we put, he put us here to to help each other and be with each other and to to be there for each other and so for those guys to really to do that for 
uh, not not just me and these guys that went on this hunt, but several people who who they've taken out on on different types of of adventures uh, have really helped. And I don't think I mentioned it in the beginning, but w- their whole point is to prevent suicide and and military first responder uh, folks. And so a way to do that is to get them outdoors and um, just kind of unwind and, and decompress from from the everyday stresses. So yeah big shout out to those guys. And if, if, if anybody is out there who, uh, wants to support what they're doing, uh, I can contact me, email me. Um, we can message me on Facebook, you know, try and get a hold of me somehow. And I can, I can get you in touch with those guys if y'all want to support. So, yeah. Um, message, follow obsession, send us an email, go through the website contact form and we'll, we'll put you in touch with Nick and he can, he can be the point on that one. So for sure, for sure. Yeah. Well, man, I, I appreciate you coming on, and I don't think I mentioned it on the podcast. I know I mentioned it to you. We we actually, in the future, we want to find a time to actually get these guys from TRG, Therapeutic Recreation Group, on our podcast to, to talk more about what they do and, and kind of the more ins and outs of everything, because it's not just hunting trips like this, like they've done you know, Colorado hiking trips, fishing trips, a, a bunch yeah. of other types of stuff that, and, and they're, and they're trying to focus really on, on our, on our area. I know there's tons of groups out there that, that do this kind of thing, you know, for, or a variation of it, you know, for military first responders, et cetera. But they're, they're pretty, my understanding is they're pretty focused here in, in our North Texas area that we're in. So we're, we're very, very grateful to have them, have them around here. And, and like I said, we'll do our best to try and at some point in the future, get them on our, on our podcast because they're local. Maybe we can, maybe we can actually make an in-person episode. So that'd be pretty, I neat. bet I bet we can, but we can make that happen pretty easy. Yeah. We'll, we'll start working on that, but man. So I, I wanted to ask you, cause you, as you mentioned at the beginning, this was number two on your bucket yeah. list. So a big one checked off right there. What's taking its place. What's next. I know the elk hunts number one, but what, what's next? Yeah. I'm going to have to go with muleys. Nice. A big muley. It doesn't matter where. <laughs> it right, can be wherever. I'm right there with you. Let's make it happen one of these days. <laughs> yeah, so. absolutely. All right, man. Well, anything else you want to you wanna hit or touch on about this experience, about this Axis hunt? No, that was that was pretty much it. Uh, I could go on and on about, about how well they treated us, but I think I'm, I'd, I'd just be beating a dead horse yeah. at this point because I think I've made it pretty clear how – how well they cared for us and uh, how well they'll care for uh, anybody who goes out there. That's, That's just awesome. the kind of people they are. Yeah. So awesome to hear for sure. So, um, well, and uh, kind of on a sidebar, it's kind of cool that uh, we got a little, this summer we got a little bit of access deer content on our, on our podcast because yeah. Drew got to go on one a couple months ago as well. And we recently recorded a podcast with him about that. So that was, that was, uh, it's pretty neat that we, kind of sandwiching those together here and yeah for sure you know gonna just another another thing that we're able to talk about and and provide some insight on so yeah yeah just one more uh tool and toolbox tool and toolbox absolutely (laughs) all right for our listeners thank you all for listening if you haven't already go to your social media account Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it might be, and go follow Fall Obsession. We post daily on there, uh, content relevant to hunting in the outdoors. We we cover hundreds of different topics uh, in the outdoors, and we try to put stuff on there that's relevant to you guys wherever you hunt. On that note, our website includes all that content. That's fallobsession.com, where you can find all of our video series, our podcasts, our educational content, whether it be videos or articles, our gear reviews, our wild game recipes. we got all sorts of different stuff on there for you guys, so be sure that you go check that out. Head on over to the YouTube channel. Um, subscribe to that because we got a lot of different video series running right now, including our Texas Dirt series, which is uh, Nick and I doing some whitetail management on the property we're on uh, out here in Texas, so pretty cool what we got going on there. Um, where as far as our podcast goes, be sure you follow and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. We're on all major podcast platforms, as well as Waypoint TV and our podcast videos we throw up on our on our YouTube channel. So if you actually if you're into the podcast video thing and you actually want to watch the conversation, see our faces, see our emotions, you can uh, you can head on over there. And then I think this is the first time any of our platforms are ever going to mention it, but I'm 
as I told you before we recorded, I'm pretty excited about a new opportunity we got coming on. But um, Fall Obsession podcast, as well as some of our media series, are also about to be on Carbon TV, um, which I'm sure a majority of people are probably familiar with the, the network that Carbon TV has going on. So we're super excited to be opening up that avenue with them and uh, more info to come on that as, as we uh, prepare for launch with them. Uh, over there at Carbon TV. So Ridge Rock, yeah. Ridge Rock Hunt Company is the, the podcast partner. Uh, Derek and Lacey over there in Mississippi, they do a, a fantastic job setting up a network of vetted and trusted outfitters across North America. So if you're looking for your next hunt, whatever it might be, wherever it might be, um, contact Derek. Nick's rocking the hat right there on, on the podcast episode right now. So and they got some pretty sweet lids. Derek posted a, a new one the other day that's that's pretty sharp. So Yeah, um, I'm gonna have to get that one. Yeah, head on over, support their brand, pick you up some merch, and uh if you're looking for a hunt coming up, give Derek a call. He will work with you to find something that works in your budget, even if it's two, three years out. You know, a hunt that you're trying to save up some preference or bonus points for, however all that works, wherever you're trying to hunt and uh, make happen in the future he'll help you figure out a plan to to go with an outfitter in in future seasons on on your dream hunt basically so head on over and check out ridge rock hunt company yeah and sam if i can add something onto that please do go get some of their merch because i was wearing this hat when i killed that axis so man you've been you've been rolling with that hat because you shot a pig with it i think the weekend before the too. weekend before yeah. so yeah th- those those ridge rock hats man they're they're good luck charms if you're superstitious at all so for sure you know, for sure go get you one I, I i wear all mine all the time actually when we before we recorded when we first got on here nick was giving me a hard time about not wearing mine in in this podcast episode so i gotta i gotta actually rep fall obsession every once in a while <laughs> but uh All right, guys, thank you all for listening to another podcast. Next week, it might be me, it might be Drew. You'll have to wait and see, but we'll catch you then for another Fall Obsession podcast episode. Catch you later.